Perna, who serves as the chief operating officer of the Countermeasures Acceleration Group, was going to retire at the end of the week. His deputy, retired Lieutenant General Paul Ostrowski, a 35-year veteran himself, will also step down from his position as director of supply production and distribution and return to civilian service. Both uh, leaders were selected due to their vast experience uh, as experts in logistics and acquisitions to lead an incredible team, including the best of government, industry, and academic professionals, to develop, manufacture, and deliver safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics for the American people. Uh, General Perna, Mr. Ostrowski, and their team accomplished this incredible feat in only 13 months, an unprecedented and historic accomplishment. To date, they have helped deliver over not, or 300, 390 million doses of COVID vaccines and almost 1 million therapeutics for the American people. And of course, they began the initial coordination to support our global donations. As the country transitions to a new normal, the department will transition leadership of vaccine operational logistics under the Countermeasures Acceleration Group to HHS. Both departments will maintain a strong partnership uh, to ensure the seamless production and delivery of vaccines. The general's retirement and Mr. Ostrowski's return to civilian service, I think, is a benchmark of that transition. And we thank them and their team for their incredible success in this really what can be called a, a Herculean mission uh, and service to their country. Uh, as the secretary himself said of uh, General Perna and his team last week, uh, thanks to his unrelenting efforts and leadership in the fight against COVID, we are in fact one step closer returning to a normal way of life. Uh, on a new topic, as I mentioned last week, uh, this Monday, yesterday, U.S. Navy Europe and the Ukrainian Navy kicked off Exercise Sea Breeze 2021 in the Black Sea with the largest number of participants in the exercise's 21 iterations. During the opening ceremony, Deputy Commander Captain Kyle Gant explained that there is nothing provocative about a naval exercise in international waters, and he's absolutely right. This long-standing exercise continues to support security and stability in the region through interoperability with our Black Sea NATO allies and partners. This week, the exercise will include force integration training, which places participants into a pre-scripted scenario that builds familiarization at sea. And then this will transition into the unscripted scenario, testing the dynamic maritime capabilities of the participants. And then lastly, uh, tomorrow, Secretary Austin looks forward to uh, welcoming and hosting General Federal Minister of Defense, Germ sorry, German Federal Minister of Defense, Annegret kramp karrenbauer uh, here at the Pentagon for a bilateral meeting. And of course, we'll, uh, there'll be uh, uh, access to the press to, to the opening comments of that meeting. Bob. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, <coughs> a question about Afghanistan uh, and trying to understand sort of the, um, the sequence of events as the U.S. military winds up its activities in Afghanistan. Will, when the Resolute Support Mission and no, excuse me, let me put it in, when General Miller leaves, will that mark the end of Resolute Support Mission, or will there be some sort of interim kind of period between the next several days or weeks and September when there will be a like a, some other commander or some other mission follow-up? Yeah, Bob, I don't want to get too far ahead of, of process here. Um, Resolute Support, as you, as you know, is a NATO operation, so it's really more appropriate for NATO to speak to uh, uh, the future of Resolute Support. Um, but it is my understanding that with the completion of the retrograde of U.S. forces, retrograde withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan, with, with accepting, of course, whatever's left behind to protect our diplomatic uh, presence, uh, that that does not necessarily mean the end of resolute support. But really, that's a question better posed to, to NATO. But the U.S. is part of NATO, and so and you're part of the mission. So Correct. will you continue to operate in some way after the retrograde is finished? When the withdrawal is complete, our mission transitions in two ways. One, to whatever U.S. forces are in Afghanistan are there to protect the diplomatic presence. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pieces to that, but it's really about protecting the diplomatic uh, mission. Um, and, and two, our bilateral relationship with Afghan forces shifts to one of uh, financial and logistical support from outside the country. But the, you know, try to think in terms of when the war, the U.S. war in Afghanistan ends, 
Is it is it the same as saying when resolute support ends, or is there going to be a, a, a sort of a separate U.S. function in you know in 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 the war? Well, I mean, again, the the removal of combat forces, which is what the retrograde is all about, ends the combat mission in, in Afghanistan for the United States, and what's left, again, is enough force posture to protect our diplomatic presence, and that's going to be the focus of. U.S. forces in Afghanistan once the withdrawal is complete. I think, you know, the best way to do this is to go back to the president's order, which is to withdraw all U.S. combat forces from Afghanistan. That's what the retrograde's all about. And when that's complete, that mission is complete. And we transition to two new missions, protecting our diplomats and uh, transitioning to a new bilateral relationship with Afghanistan. And you'll announce the end of the retrograde? We'll be as transparent as we possibly can. Hey John, yeah. along the lines of financial and logistical support, the Afghan press is saying that the U.S. will provide 37 additional Blackhawks to the Afghan military and two fixed-wing aircraft. Can you say anything about that? No, I've seen the press reports on that, Tom. I'm not in a position to confirm that level of detail. Uh -huh. uh, again, what we've said before is that we're going to continue to support them over the horizon in a logistical capacity uh, and, and certainly uh, in a financial way. I've, I've, I've got nothing on those, uh, to those, on those specifics in terms of the numbers of aircraft. Well, well, can you say anything about you expect additional aircraft to go to the Afghan military? I, I, honestly, those kinds of details are still being worked out, Tom, and I just think it's too soon to say with any great specificity right now in terms of aircraft transfers. Uh, Carla, Carla Babb? Hey, John. Thanks for doing this. I have two questions, two different topics, if you if you don't mind. Um, first on Green Village, the situation there in Syria. How many rockets were fired at U.S. forces? Can you please describe the damage and tell us who launched these rockets? And then I have a follow on Afghanistan. Yeah, Carla, we're still assessing uh, the rocket attacks, so I'm uh, not in a position to get into specifics about the number of rockets, um, and we're still assessing uh, attribution on this. I mean, I think we're all working under the assumption uh, that they were fired by uh, uh, Iran-backed militias or militia. Uh, we don't have specific attribution. Uh, and as for damage, there was some structural damage uh, to uh, to two buildings that I know of uh, on that compound. Uh, and again, you've seen uh, our reporting on this that the, there were no uh, U.S. casualties as a result. Thank you. And then on Afghanistan, the APs reported that there will be 650 U.S. troops at the embassy, hundreds more helping the Turks with the airport security. Can you confirm that? And in light that the Taliban has doubled the number of districts it controls since May 1st, that's according to FDD. Um, so in light of that, in the wake of that, is the Pentagon and the administration rethinking its post-withdrawal strategy to include defensive strikes against the Taliban in addition to the strikes against ISIS and al-Qaeda forces who threaten the homelands of the U.S. and Western allies? That was more than one more question. <laughs> uh, uh, on the numbers, no, I've seen the press reporting uh, by the Associated Press. I cannot confirm the, the specific numbers. Um, in, Important, though, to keep in mind that, as, as we've said, we're going to have uh, a certain amount of U.S. troops remain in Afghanistan to protect our diplomatic presence. We have to do that. And Afghanistan is not going to be treated like any other uh, nation where we have, uh, uh, you know, Marine Security Guard. I mean, it's, it's Afghanistan, and we understand the dynamic nature of the security threat there. So there will be some number uh, of U.S. troops there. And as we've said before, security at the airport is critical to uh, being able to protect uh, and have a diplomatic presence on the ground. We are still uh, uh, working out some of the details of what the security situation uh, is going to look like at the airport and how that's going to be facilitated. I think you all know, you all reported that uh, as you and I speak, there are uh, U.S. troops at, at the airport. Um, and what the future of that looks like, we just don't know right now. So we haven't worked our uh, our way through that. Uh, and on future missions, um, I'm simply not going to speculate or hypothesize, except to say, as I told Bob, uh, once the withdrawal of combat forces from Afghanistan is over, uh, we, we will have two new mission sets at DOD. One is to 
have a presence uh, in Kabul that is sufficient to the task of protecting our diplomacy there, and two, to, uh, con con to have a relationship with Afghanistan, a new bilateral relationship with Afghan forces uh, that is designed to help continue their needs for competency and capability in the field, but it'll be over the horizon, over the horizon logistical support and some financial support. Those are the two mission sets, and the president was very clear about that. So is the administration okay with the Taliban taking these many gains and potentially taking over the country of Afghanistan? Uh, Carla, we're, we have said before that the, the violence remains too high, um, and we're all aware of, uh, of uh, the security situation uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I think you saw General Miller speak to that uh, earlier today, uh, concerns over the, the, the security situation there. It, it, uh, what, we, what we want to see, what we'd like to see, is the Taliban return to the peace process in a, in a credible way. Um, and as we see uh, events on the ground unfold, it, it, uh, it certainly calls into question uh, the sincerity of their efforts to, to, to be a, a legitimate, credible uh, participant in the peace process. That's really the, the right future for Afghanistan as a political process that leads to a negotiated settlement and a peaceful end uh, to the fighting in Afghanistan. And that's what we're, that's what we're in favor of. That's what, uh, that's what the administration's uh, policy continues to try to pursue. Megan. You said you knew of two facilities in Syria um, that were hit yesterday. Were there people in the facilities? You're talking about the rocket attack. Yeah, the rocket attack. Were there people in the facilities around them? Were they able to get to shelter before the rockets landed? I don't have that level of detail. All I can point you back to is what we've said, that we know there were no U.S. casualties. Well, the reason I ask is because last year, with al-Assad, the original assessment was also that. no casualties, and it was I know that. You know, more than 100 traumatic brain injuries came out of it. I so understand. I'm wondering if that is also an evolving situation. We are still assessing uh, the full scope of the damage. As I said, I, I know that there were two structures hit. And, of course, you saw OIR say that you know, all personnel were accounted for, no, uh, no initial reports of casualties. But clearly, we take this very seriously. And uh, I certainly reserve the right uh, over time to, uh, uh, to provide additional context should that be necessary. I'm just giving you what we, what we know right now, and uh, it, it, we're still assessing. And so things could change, but that's what we know right now. Yeah. On Afghanistan, you said there are currently troops, U.S. troops at the airport. Are they going to be part of the diplomatic mission, or are they going to be pulled out? I, I'm not going to get ahead of plans. I'm just saying, as we speak now, uh, you know, and that's been the case for quite some time. Uh, any of you who've traveled to, to Kabul know that. Um, what that's going to look like going forward, we're still working out. What I'm, the main point I'm trying to state is that. Whatever U.S. troops remain in Afghanistan after the withdrawal is complete are there to protect our diplomats and to pr preserve our ability to have a diplomatic presence there because the president's been very clear that he wants to keep that embassy open and, and keep uh, the programs of that embassy in play. And then on, on Syria strike, like you strike and then they retaliate and then you strike back. So the first strike that you made on the sh sh Iranian-backed militias, was that an imminent threat coming up or you just it was a pre-planned stri uh, strike that you planned and you go ahead and strike? Well, I think you got your back and forth a little bit backward there. I mean, we, we, ch we chose to strike uh, at these facilities after having come under attack uh, for quite a number of weeks. Uh, by both UAVs and by rocket and mortar attacks on, uh, on our facilities and our people. Uh, so uh, it's it, not fair to say that the U.S. struck the first blow here, uh, but as we've said uh, repeatedly, uh, we've we got to protect our own people. Uh, the president's serious about that commitment, um, and uh, clearly these attacks were ongoing, and so uh, these strikes were designed to get uh, specifically at the kinds of threats that were coming at our people, particularly from UAVs. Uh, and, uh, and it was directly tied to the kinds of attacks we've been seeing. Can okay? I on that? Yeah, sure. So if, if this is a threat that's been ongoing for weeks and months, then why the timing for, of Sunday? Why now, the DO strike? Well, Courtney, you know, there's lots of factors that go into, into, into timing, including, the, um, uh, including necessary intelligence assessments, 
um, uh, that uh, that give you the assurance that you're you're hitting the right targets, the ones you want, and that you're hitting them at a, a time and a place of your choosing, in such a way as to also minimize civilian casualties and collateral damage. You know this. There's a lot of factors that go into targeting, and a, a big piece of the targeting is the win. Um, and so that was clearly the case in this regard. I'm, I'm not at liberty to go through uh, in great detail how each of those decisions was made and why. We don't think that that's uh, useful information and context to telegraph uh, to potential enemies out there. But, but we take the, the, the targeting process, including the when, very seriously. And is there any assessment on what kind of impact it actually had on, the, on like their operational ability to conduct future UAV strikes? Like, is there, uh, how, or, and also, is there any casualty, updated casualty assessment? Don't have an updated casualty uh, uh, assessment right now. The battle damage assessment is ongoing. We know we hit what we were aiming at and that we uh, destroyed the structures that, uh, that were targeted. Um, these structures were directly tied to specifically the threat from UAVs uh, in, in, you know, in terms of the logistics and maintenance uh, of them, uh, uh, the command and control of them, uh, launching and recovering of them, um, and, and perhaps even transfers uh, of uh, equipment and system support. So we're very confident that these structures were tied directly to the kinds of threats from UAVs that our people and our facilities were under. Transfer from Iran to? Just, I just, I won't go any more than that, but, but transfer capability. Yeah. Just yeah. a quick one. So uh, between January 22 and end of Mar March, there were only about like eight attacks uh, from these militia groups. But from, um, uh, in, from April to today, there's been about 20. Do you have an assessment why uh, these attacks have increased? I think that's a great question for the Iran-backed militias that, that are doing this. Uh, I, I, not capable of getting inside their headspace and their decision-making loop, uh, but you're right, the attacks have continued, um, and, and it's dangerous. Uh, and the president and the secretary, they have an obligation to protect our people and, and our uh, facilities, and, and that's what we're trying to do. Jen. Um, John, what impact will, if they repeal the AUMF, the three AUMFs on the Hill, what impact would that have on you, your ability to do this in the future? Are you in favor? Would it be a problem for this department if the AUMFs were repealed? And back to Bob's question, how do you plan to mark the end of the Afghan war? It seems as though no senior leaders are flying over there. Is there a ceremony plan, or are you just going to kind of go out quietly in the middle of the night. Thanks, Jen. Um, on your first one, I, I don't want to get ahead of congressional action. That, that's really for members of Congress to speak to. The president had the authority to conduct these strikes under Article Two of the Constitution, his responsibilities as commander in chief to protect our, uh, uh, our troops. And we're confident in that legal justification. Separate and distinct from that, you've heard the secretary say that he's in favor, uh, as the president is in favor, of uh, a more narrowly defined AOMF from 2002. Uh, so the, the department's in full support of, of taking a look at that AOMF and, and more narrowly defining uh, the framework on it. As for the end of the war, um, I, I'm certainly not going to speak to uh, VIP travel one way or the other, but um, I can assure you we're all mindful, all of us here. Um, of the fact that this war is now two decades on um, and is coming to a close, um, and of our responsibility to communicate the closure of that to you and to the American people, and we will do that. Um, uh, we also have to be especially mindful, Jen, of the dynamic situation in Afghanistan. This isn't, uh, uh, you, you can't compare it. Uh, to the retrograde out of uh, Iraq, different, completely different security situation. Uh, we've said all along uh, that we uh, have to assume that it could be contested. It hasn't been so far. Um, we also said that we want to make it orderly and safe. It has been so far, uh, and we want to keep that going until the very end. But yes, uh, we, we will uh, find a way to mark it officially and to state it unequivocally for the American people uh, at the right time and in an appropriate way. Yes, ma'am. 
back to Iraq, um, given the frequency and the increase uh, of the number of attacks, is there a concern here in the Pentagon that this might lead to more involvement or maybe uh, like an escalation uh, on the ground there, there? I think you saw when we talked about the, the strikes over the weekend uh, that they really were intended to disrupt and deter future such at attacks. Now, that remains to be seen. I, I understand that. Nobody is interested in escalating tensions. Nobody is interested in further violence in Iraq or in Syria. Our troops are there at the request of the Iraqi government to help them in their fight against ISIS, which is still a relevant mission. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's all about the whole purpose of us being there is all about helping protect uh, uh, the Iraqi people and our own national security interests. So we have no interest in. Uh, in, in having this escalate uh, into some sort of broader conflict. But we do have a responsibility to protect our people and our facilities. Uh, and that is what the president ordered over the weekend. Uh, Tara. Hi, John. Thanks for doing this. Um, following up on Jen's question, there's been some pushback on the Hill about whether uh, the president had the authority for these strikes without consulting them. And I was wondering if the secretary or another senior leader would be going up to the Hill to brief members on the reasons why a strike was necessary now. And then I have one follow up. Uh, I think uh, the I, I think you saw uh, the White House speak to the fact that they are certainly willing to uh, provide uh, a briefing to members of Congress uh, about these strikes and, and how and why they were conducted. Uh, but again, uh, Tara, I go back to saying that the, the president was operating uh, clearly and unequivocally inside his Article II uh, authorities to, for, for self-defense, to, uh, to protect his troops. And then as a follow-up, um, is the Pentagon considering taking additional defensive measures for uh, the footprint in Syria to add defenses, add troops potentially, uh, since it seems like some of these attacks may be escalating? I know of no force posture changes coming to Iraq or Syria. And again, as for specific force protection measures, you know we don't talk about that publicly. We'll do what we have to do to make sure our people are safe. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, John. Uh, I like uh, talking about the sea breeze exercise with the white logo. Uh, according to the South Korean military authority, that United States recently requested South Korea's participation in the multinational exercise, Sibley's 21. I'm sorry, what was the question? The yeah. yeah, that still I'm finished. I didn't finish yet. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. I'll stand back. What they, uh, what they say that the South Korean newspaper said, in response, the South Korean Ministry of uh, Defense and the uh, Navy said, quote, our military has been invited to the training, but there is no plan to participate or observe the joint exercise itself. What is your comment? Because South Korea didn't want to join this exercise. It's a sovereign decision by a nation state, um, and uh, they're certainly entitled to make that decision and to speak to that decision, and we absolutely respect it. But this is the multinational exercise mm -hmm. why uh, South Korea rejected this uh, training. Do you think the participation of South Korea in this exercise is essential? I don't think they would have been invited if, if uh, there wasn't a genuine desire to have them uh, participate in whatever way they deemed fit. They have uh, obviously chosen uh, not to participate, and we respect that. It doesn't change the strength of the alliance or our commitment to the people of South Korea or our security commitments there on the peninsula. It doesn't change it one bit. But this is really a better question put to officials in Seoul. I mean, it's a sovereign decision to participate or not. And we respect that. So you respect them. Doesn't matter if they were joined or not joined. 
I didn't say it didn't matter. I mean, uh, but it's their decision to make and their decision to, to speak to, and we absolutely respect it. Right, thank yeah. you. Uh, Tom Squitteri. Hi, John. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Great. Um, How are you? I have a question. I'm great, thanks. A uh, question on what's the Pentagon's assessment of the strategic value of the just announced deal between Indonesia and the United States on a new maritime center at the south end of the South China Sea at the time? I'm going to take that question. I didn't. Thank I didn't. You. I didn't see the announcement, so let me take the question. Yeah, it, it, it was announced. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I completely understand it, but we'll take it. And uh, I don't want to. The dog has some thoughts. Tom. <laughs> the dog is a good idea. Yeah. Dog is taking the question as well. Orn. At this point, how many districts have the Taliban taken, and how many have the Afghans taken back? And then, of the troops that have yet to come out, are you able to share information on what units they're from? Uh, on the number of districts, we know that they continue to attack district centers. I'm uh, not going to get into an intelligence assessment here, uh, but, but clearly we know that they continue these attacks. Uh, and as I said at the outset, the, the violence is too high. And as General Miller said today, the security situation certainly is concerning over there. Um, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't get into a specific number uh, of district centers right now that, uh, that they have taken over. What's Important to say, and I'll say it again, is that we want to see a peace process that's credible uh, and Afghan-led and leads to a negotiated settlement. And that's what we all want to see the Taliban commit to, is to, uh, sitting down at the table and, and working through this negotiated settlement, because a political solution is really the best solution for the Afghan people, and nothing's changed about the United States' desire to see that end. I don't have a breakdown of units uh, that have left or are leaving and where they're going back to, that's really a better question put to CENTCOM. I just don't have that level of detail. Uh, but as you well know, Oren, uh, uh, th there wasn't all that many uh, troops left in Afghanistan when President Biden took office anyway. So um, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't come as a shock that, uh, that we're able to move them out at a, at a brisk pace. And again, we're trying to do this in a very safe and orderly way, understanding that the security situation is still dynamic. Yes. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, I want to ask you about the U.S. Philippines relations. Last week, the Biden administration approved the potential sale of the F-16 aircraft as advanced uh, missiles to, to Manila. Uh, does that mean to, to where? Uh, to Manila, the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does that meant to encourage Manila to extend the visiting forces agreement permanently? I, I won't talk about um, foreign arms sales just because that's really the purview of the State Department. Um, we obviously uh, uh, are glad to see uh, another decision to uh, suspend the termination of the visiting forces agreement. We believe it's part and parcel of a strong alliance that we have with the Philippines, and we obviously want to see that continue. Um, I think it would be uh, unfortunate if people were to try to draw a parallel between arms sales and the VFA uh, uh, as a carrot and a stick sort of approach. That's, uh, I, I think that would be drawing the wrong conclusion here. Okay. Quick follow up. The, the Philippines extended the agreement just temporarily for another six months. Correct. Yeah. Could you uh, give us a sense of how urgent is it to make the agreement permanent in order to revitalize the bilateral relationship and get China uh, in the South China Sea? Right. I'd rather not get ahead of process here. We're glad that the termination was suspended ag again to give us a chance to continue to have these discussions uh, with the Philippine government, and we look forward to that. Uh, again. The alliance is important to the United States, uh, it's important to the Philippines, it's important to the region, uh, and nothing's changed about our commitment to our uh, security requirements underneath that alliance. And we'll see where these discussions go, but I don't want to get ahead of that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Laura Seligman. Hey, John. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just wondering if there is uh, any concern that the government of Iraq has condemned the airstrikes and Iraqi officials 
are now talking again openly about the U.S. leaving. Um, so are, are there any concerns? Um, is Secretary Austin concerned? And are there any plans for the U.S. military to withdraw from Iraq? We value our partnership with uh, the Iraqi government. As I said earlier, we're there at their invitation uh, to help them and their forces uh, fight against ISIS. And that mission continues. It's not a new thing, Laura, that we have been talking to the Iraqis about what the potential uh, end of this uh, on the ground presence looks like and, and means those technical talks have happened and I suspect they'll continue to happen. Uh, and look, we also respect uh, the, the Iraqi government's uh, uh, right to, to uh, express their concerns uh, uh, about what goes on inside their, their borders. The president made this decision uh, specifically uh, under his Article II authorities to protect our people and to protect our facilities and to hopefully disrupt and, de and, uh, and deter uh, future attacks. We recognize that the uh, Iraqi government uh, is, uh, you know, ha has a, a tough job to do, uh, but we also recognize that our partnership is, is important for all the reasons that I've already stated. Did you alert the Iraqi government before the strikes? Now, I'm not going to talk about the specific communications uh, before conducting a military strike, uh, we we acted again in, uh, under Article II authorities, uh, completely consistent with the, the president's uh, right and responsibility to protect U.S. troops, uh, in, you know, at home and, and overseas. Uh, Paul Hanley. Hi, John. I got two questions, uh, one on COVID, one on Afghanistan. Is the Pentagon considering or is it taking any new action or considering any action for the U.S. forces to deal with the uh, threat of the Delta strain of the, the COVID virus? I'm not enough of an expert on the Delta strain to speak to that. We're going to have a COVID briefing tomorrow. And I think uh, if you wouldn't mind re-putting uh, re that question to our briefers tomorrow, that's probably a better way to get an answer on that. Okay. Secondly, uh, you've repeated and others repeat that uh, the violence, the level of violence is too high in Afghanistan and the advances of the Taliban is concerning. Uh, the amount of times you say that makes me wonder, is there uh, a situation where the violence remains too high that the U.S. would adjust its stance on the pullout? Uh, if not, then why is this an issue to keep saying that the violent level of violence is too high and uh, very concerning. It's an issue because it's an issue. It's an issue because the violence is too high and the Afghan people deserve better after 20 years of war. And that's why uh, we continue to urge a diplomatic end to this war, a political process that leads a negotiated settlement that is Afghan led um, and is uh, in keeping with the Afghan people's desire for peace and security and prosperity in their country. That's why we keep saying it, because it's true, because it's important to, uh, uh, to stressing the need for a, a diplomatic end to this, uh, to this war. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than four times as many troops and veterans of the war since 9-11 are believed to have died by suicide, more than killing the war themselves. There's a new study, maybe have you heard no, the Brown University estimates more than 30,000. What is your comment about it? Also, you serve for this country. Also, plus what the Pentagon does do to stop for that. Mm. Would like to hear for the new studies. It's a, it's a sobering study. Um, I, I'm not... Uh, By Brown University, yeah. Mm -hmm. By Brown University. Yeah. Right. It's a sobering study. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're aware of it. Uh, uh, we uh, are well aware also of uh, the problem of suicides in the ranks, and frankly, uh, even outside the ranks in family members, uh, and it's deeply troubling. And there's a lot of reasons for it for each individual case. Um, it's difficult to pin it on any one factor. It's one of the reasons why the that uh, that we've been trying so hard to remove the stigma inside the military of seeking help 
for mental health issues. Uh, and it's why uh, the secretary has put such an emphasis uh, on looking at suicide prevention uh, programs to make sure that we've got the ones that are right in place and that we also encourage uh, and are actively so uh, colleagues and teammates to look out for one another uh, and uh, uh, to, to keep checking in on one another uh, so that we can try to read the signs before they get there. But it's very, it's a very difficult problem uh, to get our arms around, and I can tell you we're taking it very, very seriously. But those are somber numbers, no doubt about it. Um, and, and our own numbers uh, are somber enough when it comes to this. Um, I'll just leave by saying what the Secretary has said himself, that, that seeking help for mental health issues is not, does not show weakness. It's, it's a sign of strength, and we want everybody to, to believe that. To, to, to take it in uh, and, to, and to act on that. It's definitely got all of our attention here at, at the department. Yeah. I got time for just uh, one or two more and then I really do have to go. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you for taking my question. Um, uh, Chancellor Merkel, German Chancellor Merkel has been uh, widely reported uh, talking about the need for a more unified Europe and a stronger Europe on the defense side as well. Um, looking ahead to tomorrow's visit, uh, would you care to talk a little bit about the U.S.-German uh, defense relationship going ahead? It's a very strong bilateral relationship. Uh, one of the Secretary's first overseas trips was to uh, Berlin uh, uh, to meet with uh, Minister Kramp Karrenbauer, and uh, we look forward to having her here uh, tomorrow as well to continue that relationship and continue that dialogue. Uh, Germany is a critical ally uh, and a good friend, uh, and uh, we look forward again to having a, a, a very strong bilateral relationship going forward. Um, if a member of the military is in pain, do you encourage them to go to the doctor? I would think yes. If they're in pain, to go see the doctor. Why, oh. why if they're in mental pain, aren't they encouraged then to go see the doctor? I they are. That's kind of the attitude. What's the attitude? Uh, just in terms of thinking about it, not just of, as mental health, but in terms of in, internal pain. I'm, I think we're talking about a distinction without a difference, ma'am. Uh, there's, there's, there's absolutely no communications coming from department leadership that if you're in mental anguish uh, that you can't seek help. We want you to seek help. We want you to raise your hand and, and, and tell somebody and get the help you need. There's uh, terrific mental health professionals uh, uh, inside the Department of Defense that are uh, more than qualified to, to help our people and their families deal with this. So we are very actively encouraging people. It's, again, as the Secretary said, seeking help for mental health issues is not a weakness, it's a strength. And what we have to do a better job here is removing that stigma inside the ranks because that there is still a stigma uh, to Ask, to raising your hand and asking for help. Uh, and, you know, we need to obliterate that stigma, too. Okay, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome.